Welcome to part two, Happy Earth Day 2021. We have an interview especially for you starting right now. Welcome to the Weird and Wacky Planet's Nature Just Got Real podcast for kids. Join KB Carr, author of the Weird and Wacky Planet series with Chuck Darwin, Tito and Captain Jack as they bring you the real skinny on what's really going on in the natural world. And now, here's your host, KB Carr. Hello, Planeteers. So this is the second part of Happy Earth Day 2021. Remember the first time we made some straws for the part one? Uh, we made our own straws. And this part two is going to be an interview with Tracy Ritchie, the Director of Education at EarthDay.org. And she's going to tell us how Earth Day got started, when did it get started, who started it, uh, what they're doing now, what kind of things kids and uh, and families can do to help the planet. So let's get to it, shall we? Hello, Planeteers. Today I have uh, Tracy Ann. Do I tell you Tracy Ann or just Tracy? Just Tracy is fine. Just Tracy. Tracy Ritchie, and she is the Director of Education at EarthDay.org. And I'm super excited to be talking to her because you know we're doing our, this is our Earth Day uh, episode. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm just going to start off by asking Tracy, um, who a little bit about herself. How did you become the, the director of education? It sounds very important. Sure. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be here and talk more about Earth Day, specifically Earth Day 2021 and what everybody can do this year. So I've been in the field of environmental education for a little over 15 years now. I've worked in different positions from working at nature centers. I've worked with sea turtles out on the coast. Uh, And then I've had a couple of different jobs where I've been able to help influence policy and how students learn in school. And so I'm so excited about my position at EarthDay.org because I get to do a little bit of everything. So I help create resources and lesson plans for students all around the world. And I also help uh, global policy to make sure that every student in the world gets equal access to environmental education in their schools, in their classrooms, and anywhere else they learn, like zoos, aquariums, museums, things like that. Wow. That's like, that's a lot. (laughs) A lot, but it's very exciting. All right. So we have you to thank when we're going into accredited zoos and aquariums for a lot of their educational programs. Well, I can't take all that credit. That is definitely uh, the amazing education staff at zoos and aquariums. But I like to think I have a small part in helping making it more accessible to a larger audience. That's awesome. That's awesome. Can you tell us um, what exactly is Earth Day and, and how did it get started? Absolutely. So Earth Day is really fun and exciting because it's a holiday. It's celebrated and acknowledged all over the world. And Earth Day started from an idea. Uh, It started with Senator Nelson in Wisconsin in the late 1960s. And he was just seeing a lot of environmental problems in the United States. There were oil spills that were really traumatic and um, happening off the coast of California. There was a river in Ohio, the Cuyahoga River, that was so polluted, it was regularly catching on fire. So imagine seeing a river on fire because it had so many pollutants in it. Uh, The smog was really bad in urban areas. People were having a hard time uh, who had respiratory or breathing issues. We also saw a lot of wildlife um, becoming endangered or becoming close to endangered. Uh, We knew from Rachel Carson and her book called Silent Spring that bird populations were struggling a lot, especially the bald eagle, our national symbol. And there was a lot of really in your face environmental issues like smog and pollution and litter uh, all around. So Senator Nelson wanted to take something, an opportunity for collective action where we could all work together to protect the environment. And he was really inspired in the late 60s by there was the anti-war movement about the Vietnam War and there was the civil rights movement that were all very active at that point. And he wanted to harness that energy and excitement 
and talk about the environment. So he organized what we called an environmental teach-in. And that was the first Earth Day. And that was in 1970. April 22nd, 1970 was the first Earth Day. And it was really this chance for people to come together and uh, talk about these issues together. So 1970, that was the first ever organized like national Earth Day when it became a recognized day. So it's exactly. not the Earth's birthday like some people think it is. That Correct. Is, <laughs> because <laughs> that would be weird. How would we know that? Right. <laughs> so, but that's the, the birthday of Earth Day as an organization, as a national day. Uh, great. Ex- oh. Exactly. It's a, it's a time to come together to talk to the environment or talk about the environment and what we can do to take action together to solve some environmental issues that people are experiencing. Um, While it did start as one day, April 22nd in 1970, we like to say that Earth Day is every day. So we hope that people aren't just taking environmental action on one day or one week, uh, but it did start as one day uh, as a holiday in the United States, but now it's acknowledged all over the world in over 190 countries around the world participate in some kind of Earth Day activity. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I want you guys to know that I was like, I was nine when that started. So now if you guys do the math, you're going to know how old I am. So <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. But <laughs> but I was nine and I remember I remember that. And it was a, it was a big deal. Um, and it you know, started becoming a big deal at uh, at school. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it started as something fairly small. And what was really cool is also Senator Nelson hired college students to organize the first Earth Day. And think back to 1970, there wasn't social media, there wasn't the internet, uh, there was, you know, communicating with each other was much more difficult. And they still managed to get 20 million Americans to come out and have some kind of event on the first Earth Day. So it's been really impressive to hear what those first students did to organize everybody and get everyone really excited about this first Earth Day and how it's grown to be such a global movement and gets I bigger each year. Look what it is now. That's so exciting. And yeah, uh, and yeah that's that is a huge accomplishment to get that many people on board that quickly for something relatively new. So I think Mm -hmm. that alone would just kind of show us that, that people do care about this. This is, this is something, the planet is something that people do care about and more people care about it than don't, I think these days. So absolutely encouraging. That's a really good sign. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so we kind of went over why it was, what was started. Um, what are some things that have been achieved since 1970? Um, yeah, yeah that's what, a great what, question. What have we accomplished so far? There, you know? There's so much that we can point to and acknowledge that came about because of the first Earth Day. Uh, One of the biggest achievements in the United States is that with the first Earth Day happening in April of 1970, By December, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, was formed, and that can be attributed a lot to the first Earth Day, where people were coming together and demanding a better, safer, cleaner environment. Um, And it's crazy to think that the EPA did not exist before the first Earth Day, Um, but that agency at the national level helped protect natural resources. From there, we got the first Endangered Species Act uh, so we could protect plants and animals uh, more carefully. Uh, We had other landmark legislation like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and things put into place that we could make sure our resources stayed safe, uh, stayed clean, and stayed available for future generations. So a lot of the early environmental legislation came because the first Earth Day gathered so many people saying, we want a better, cleaner, safer environment. So that was a huge achievement. Yeah, I did not know that there was no EPA before that. that, Isn't that crazy? uh, A lot of this legislation has gone into place because of it. And, you know, I love for people to to do the right thing because it's the right thing. But we Mm -hmm. all know it doesn't always work that way. So we do have to put laws into place uh, to, to have those protections stick. So. Absolutely. And it's it's something for, for everybody to think of. It's things that we could think of as individuals and what we do with our daily, daily habits and daily decisions. But it's also something very important for large companies and corporations and industries. It helps manages their behavior as well to make sure that 
there's so much that we can do as individuals, but a lot has to happen at the high levels of major industries and companies and how they impact our planet as well. It does. It absolutely does. And uh, and so leading into that, so as individuals, what are some things that kids can do and families can do uh, to, to help the earth? What are some things we can do on our personal level uh, absolutely. to do the decisions that we make? The great answer is there's so much. There's absolutely so many things. And I want to make sure that your audience knows that everybody can make a difference. No matter what your age, everybody absolutely can make a difference. And when we work together, we can make an even bigger impact. So imagine, you know, the daily actions and habits you have every day. And if you were to make sure you turn off the lights when you leave the room or shut off the faucet while you're brushing your teeth That's a big or one. take your bike when you can instead of the car, um, those are just little easy things that we could do, but they add up over time. And if we all did a few of those things that add up even more. So the great thing is that there's so much we can do, but I also want to encourage young students that you have a voice. Even if you're not able to vote yet, if you're under 18 in the United States, there's still so much that you can do to talk to your local elected officials, to talk to your school and your teachers, and tell them what's important to you. So if you want to see more recycling at your school, or maybe you want to have a garden so you can promote native pollinators like butterflies or bees, or maybe having different options in the cafeteria of the different kinds of food you'd like to eat that maybe have a little less impact on the planet. There's so many things that you can do. You can write petitions, you can write letters, you can have conversations like the first Earth Day a teach-in. You can host a teach-in whenever you want to have these conversations and tell people what's important to you and what would you like to see change. If there's something that's not quite going exactly as you would like it, you can absolutely tell people that you have an idea, you'd like to see some change, you'd like to do some better actions for the planet, and we can all work together to make that happen. I love it. And I and I was thinking while you were talking, I was thinking um, at one point in my school, we had had a discussion about banning styrofoam products mm -hmm. from the cafeteria. You know, could we get rid of all that styrofoam that doesn't break down in a landfill and just not have that anymore and swap that out with Absolutely. other um, environmentally friendly type of type of products instead? Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many things that we can think about how much waste we produce, both in the classroom and the cafeteria and our home, and make it a competition and see if we can produce less waste or increase how much we recycle. Or if you don't have composting, find out A, what composting is and how we can help things break down naturally so they don't have to go to the landfill. And how do we make composting an option wherever we are? Um, there's also a couple of other options for Earth Days, like cleanups, you can participate in a um, safe uh, and careful cleanup event where maybe you're not going out in a large group, but you can go out with your family just around your neighborhood or down your street uh, and use gloves or um, those grabber things. Uh, so you're not, you're being very careful because, you know, during the COVID virus, we have to be very careful about what we touch, but there's definitely ways that we could participate in a safe cleanup and just help clean up our communities. Uh, we also, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but citizen science is a great way to get involved um, and help contribute scientific data uh, for researchers around the world. Um, and just educating yourself, having a conversation at the dinner table about new environmental issues that you're learning about. Share them with your siblings and your parents uh, or anyone else in your family and also your friends. Maybe your friends didn't hear the same information you did. So just having more conversations about the environment and what you know, that's a really great way to be involved. Love it. Love it. And uh, yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about that next. <laughs> because okay, great. Earthday.org has an app. <laughs> we're, we're really big on apps here. We love Good. apps. <laughs> so tell us about the Earthday.org app and what, what can we do with that? This is probably one of the most exciting projects I've been on since I've been here with Earth Day. And it's, it's just so different and it has a lot of different pieces to it. So there's something for everybody is what I like to say. So the app is called Earth Challenge 2020, 
However, we're changing the name <laughs> because it's not 2020 anymore. So depending on when you hear this, uh, this podcast, it's either called Earth Challenge 2020 or Global Earth Challenge. And you'll recognize it because you'll see a little data pin with the earth. And that's how you know that it's us. I downloaded it. I've got it Perfect. in my phone right now. So, oh, great. so yeah, I'm excited to see what, what kind of things um, can kids and families do with that app? How can we get involved? Absolutely. So once you download the app, and we recommend that you download it at home first, just because it's a very big app, and it has lots and lots of information in it. So download it at home before you go outside. But then you can explore four different research projects that we have within it right now, all around citizen science, and you become the scientist yourself and help collect data. So there's one, uh, so within the app, there's four what we call widgets. So they're four separate research projects. Each has their own widget. One is about pollinators and where you can find pollinators. So if you're ever walking around outside, either in your backyard or at a nature spot or a park, um, or even just down the street in your community, and you see a bee especially, but it could be any pollinator, take a picture ever so safely of that pollinator and submit it into the app. And then we know we can find out where all the different pollinators are located. So this really helps us track down how many bees and other pollinators are in our area, where do they exist, and what kind of by the picture, we can usually judge what kind of plants they're attracted to as well. So it helps us just understand what is the current bee population and other pollinator populations, and what can we do to help support them. You know, we're going to be ta- we're going to be doing a show, an episode about pollinators coming up in the oh, next month great. or two. So if you guys got that app and you figured out, you know, you're going to, we're going to, we're going to do a follow-up show about pollinators. And I think you guys are going to be pretty, pretty geeked if you can identify them in your own area and see what's going on. That's cool. It's in your own backyard. That's great. And we have within the app, we help you to learn different kinds of bumblebee species that are, that exist and how to tell them apart. So that's part of the learning process of the app of not only do you take a picture of the bees if you see them, but we help you sort what kind of bee it is. So it it also helps you learn about different bees that are in your area. Yeah, we know Um, some of those are endangered from a past episode. So we want to know if that was in your area or not. And that's why it's so important because Bees do so much for us. We should actually be really, really grateful for bees because they help not only pollinate the flowers that are so pretty in our area, especially around springtime, with everything blooming outside, but they also pollinate plants that we eat. So bees are so important because they make sure that we have enough food to eat in our areas. So we want to make sure we can protect the bees as much as we can. Yep. We're, we're big fans of bees here. Very big fans. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. And so also within the app, so you can look at bees, but you can also look at your air quality. And by taking a picture of your horizon or the sky that you see in front of you, and you submit that photo, it connects you to an air quality monitor in your area. So we can help learn about your air quality too. So this helps us understand Sometimes when we see a cloudy day or maybe it's hazy, sometimes we may think it's poor air quality, but it's not. Maybe it's just the weather. And sometimes if we see a very clear day, we might think that the air quality is really great, but there could be other things in the area that we just don't know about or we can't see. So this app helps us find out how do we understand air quality by just what we see and how do we know to be a bit more careful sometimes if maybe it doesn't look like poor air quality, but there might be some precautions we need to take if there's something else in the air that we don't know about. Good. That's great. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, it is hard to, sometimes you can see it when I was, when I was in Southern California, I mean, you could see mm-hmm. it, <laughs> right? but here I'm in Michigan and I can't always, I can't always tell what the air quality is. So I do have like the weather channel app that'll kind of tell mm-hmm. me because I have allergies. So right. this would be very cool to be able to take a picture and then get that information. Yeah. It'd be really cool. And so much about this app is also not are we collecting data to help understand our environment better, but we can help teach machines and technology what what to understand. And so this is part of what we call artificial intelligence 
uh, and training that artificial intelligence to better connect that information. So if we give the computer tons and tons of pictures of good air quality and bad quality and connect that to the actual air quality that's me measured by monitors, then we can start to train that information of, we see a picture and we could tell the air quality just by the picture, which would be really, really cool and help get that information further for people who need it, like people with allergies or asthma who might have to be more careful when they go outside if the air quality isn't as good. Right, right. That is um, um, that's exciting. Yeah, and then the two other parts really quick is, one is a widget about food supply, and it's helping us to understand where different crops are grown around the world. So we can understand how much of different kinds of food we have available to us in different areas of the world. So for that one, you don't need to go outside, you can actually stay at home and you help us go through photos of different crop types that people have taken pictures of. And you can help identify, is it um, soy? Is it corn? Is it, um, there's a couple of other ones I'm forgetting right now, but you help, first we teach you what the crops look like, and then you can help sort through the photos and tell us what kind of crop they are. Uh, and the last one is connected to our cleanup efforts. So if you are going outside and doing a safe cleanup, you can help report the plastic pollution that you are finding in your communities. And that helps us better understand where is plastic pollution and what kinds of plastic pollution that we're seeing in nature and how do we help address the source of that problem. So a lot of times we participate in cleanups and that's a great thing to do and it helps clean up your communities, but it's not really addressing the root cause of the problem of how is that litter getting there? Where is it coming from? And how can we stop it from getting there in the first place? Um, I think we could measure success is if we didn't have to do any more cleanups anymore, if our environment was just clean and free of litter, that would be a job well done. That'd so the app, <laughs> the app is going to help us understand where is that pollution and how do we identify where it's coming from so we could stop it from getting there in the first place. Right, right. Uh, and the other thing, if you're going to go out and do a cleanup, um, they also make trash bags that break down in a landfill that you can put things in so so that you're not adding to the problem with your trash bag. That's so we'll, a great we'll talk idea. talk about that in another episode, too. I'll show you what I got going on here. Yeah, okay. that's great. And understanding what you can recycle in your community, too. So when you're doing a cleanup, if you can bring two different kinds of bags would be great, too, where you could put trash that needs to go to the landfill in one bag and anything that you can recycle in a second bag. That way you don't have to separate it later and get your hands all dirty That's again, great uh, but that you can have two idea. separate bags yeah. uh, and then you can have two helpers and making sure that you separate the trash for the landfill and what can be recycled later. That's a great idea. I love that actually. Yes. More than yes. Separate it right there while you're doing it. Yeah. So you're Makes it much easier. You don't have to do it later. Yeah. I like one job. <laughs> exactly. <not> two jobs. <laughs> kind of be efficient. Right. Yes. Well, I can't wait to to delve into this app and, and see everything it's going to do. So I'm excited about that. And yeah. I know that you're busy, so we'll let you go here. But uh, before we go, um, I just, I ask every guest this question. What do you want kids to know um, about Earth Day or or the future or, or anything else? What What would you like them to know? What, what's sure. The takeaway? I think what's so important to know about Earth Day, well, I guess there's a few things. So one, again, Earth Day is every day. It doesn't need to just be one day in April that we think about the planet and that's it. We definitely want you to be thinking about the planet every day. Um, and two, that there's so much you can do. You don't have to wait to be a grown up or have a job in the environment. Uh, we want everyone to be excited about the planet and what they can do and take actions for the planet every single day. It could be as simple as not taking a straw if you don't need it at a restaurant or for takeout or again, recycling different items. Or the first thing you also want to think about is instead of the reduce, reuse, recycle, the three R's. Recycle is the last one. The first one is reduce. How can you reduce your waste first? How can you reuse items that you already have? And then if the last option is recycle if you don't need it anymore. Um, so just thinking about our daily habits and what we can do. And again, like I said before, that you each have a voice, that 
what you think about the environment absolutely matters. And there's things that we can all do to help make a difference and to encourage our adults in our life to make a change to uh, thinking back to that first Earth Day that was mostly organized by college students. These weren't, you know, political officials or older adults. These were college students and they made the first Earth Day a huge success, one of the largest events in our country's history. Um, so, you know, don't wait. There's things that we can do now. There's things that we can do together. Uh, and your your voice and your opinion matters. So let us know how we can help you uh, and come visit our website because we've got tons of resources to help you with that. Thank you so much. And I will, I will be posting the links to that website in the show right. notes. Um, and this is why we call ourselves Planeteers. Right, guys? This is yeah. what we do. Thanks and so much for all that you do. We are going to be making our own straws uh, that break down cool. in the landfill. So if you really, really have to have a straw, now you know how to make your own. All That's right. really cool. Well, thank you so much, Trace. We really, really appreciate you being here with us and telling us all about Earth Day and what it is and how it got started and so many, so many things in there I did not even know or even think about. So thank you so mm. much. Uh, we My really pleasure. Thanks for the time. invitation. And I really enjoyed pe- speaking with your audience today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Have you ever seen a dragon covered in fingernails? How about a mermaid who vacuums the ocean floor every day? Or a pocket Dracula no bigger than your thumb? You can meet these animals and more in the book Weird and Wacky Endangered Creatures 1, part of the Weird and Wacky Planet series by KB Carr. Look for them wherever books are sold and get your flippers on your own coffee. All right. I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to Tracy and, and the ideas that she has as much as I did. So go ahead and implement some of those uh, some of those ideas that she had. Don't forget to make your own straws. This was a super fun project, and uh, we went over that in part one. And the other thing I kind of wanted to touch base wa- with was the, on the uh, on the plan, on the lesson plan. Instead of doing a lesson plan this time, I did the straw project. Gave you that sheet. Another sheet I'm giving you is a. Um, a PDF of something you can print that just kind of goes through the whole reduce, reuse, recycle. And it also gives you space for some ideas that you can can come up with on your own. So check out that worksheet. All right. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, go have a, a reduce, reuse, recycle adventure in your neighborhood. And happy Earth Day. That wraps up the show for today. Thank you to our sponsor, Weird and Wacky Planet. And thank you for listening. Thank you for caring and thank you for sharing. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Let us know if you do and we might mention you on the show. Until next week, go have an adventure in your neighbourhood. <laughs>